college football nerds talking Ohio State and Nebraska. Y'all, it's a weird week this week for college football. Didn't know what games to pick, but this one is interesting based on what happened last year, based on the fact that we haven't been able to give Ohio State much love this year. Wanted to chat about it. Please remember, like and subscribe helps us out a ton. This week we did a USC video, USC Washington video. Uh, we reviewed what in the world happened, Georgia and Notre Dame last week, and we give our top 10 in a separate video, which allows us to talk about a handful of teams instead of just two in a preview. All right, first week of the year that we're doing our computer model. Our computer model has been pretty proven over the last four years, so you might be interested, you might not. Ohio State fans, Josh, my co-host, gave us hell last year when our model predicted a Michigan win, predicted it closer than Vegas, but they told us to burn the model after we didn't. It's back. It's still weird, but I think it'll beat Vegas and S&P again this year for the fifth year in a row. All right, Josh, um, under Urban Meyer... Ohio State, it's no secret, was known to roll out a clunker here and there against an inferior team. Last year, he did it three times, in my opinion. Um, Maryland, obviously Purdue, and the other one was Nebraska. Ohio State, personnel-wise, should have absolutely hammered Nebraska. Um, they didn't. They got sloppy, gave up a ton of points. Um, I have maintained since day one, even before Ryan Day was named the starter, something about him, I don't know, it's intangible, made me feel that, that those days are gone under Ryan Day. For all the other things that we may not get that we got with, from Erwin Meyer, we're going to get a more focused team on game day against the, I don't want to say scrubs, Nebraska's not a scrub, but against the teams that are maybe not expected to give Ohio State a full uh, four quarters of a game. So in your opinion or in the data, do you think that this is one of those games this year that might have historically been a trap game for Ohio State under Urban Meyer but may not be under Ryan Day and we're looking at blowout city? So the first part that I would address in answering your question is I agree with you that I don't think Ryan Day is as likely to just roll out a stinker as happened in the Urban Meyer era. And... You know, we could have a long discussion of that, but when you're a top five team or a top ten team, you don't generally lose to low quality teams. And when we go through examples of it, I often point out the fact that top ten teams don't lose to teams outside the top seventy. Period. It does not happen. Even your worst examples like your your Purdue's, you're still talking teams in like the thirties and the forties and SP plus. Uh, I think the worst example uh, on record was that Iowa State loss from Oklahoma State that caused the all SEC BCS and created the playoff. And even they were really at like I think fifty fourth in NSP plus. However, and we don't normally do this, the model is flagging this as a weird game. Now going into the season, we we were uh, did the Buckeye Grove podcast with Kyle Lamb. You know, I really espouse the fact that I didn't really have a lot of faith that Nebraska was going to be a trap game for Ohio State. Nebraska, in my view, was reloading way too much defensively. I didn't think they were going to be a very good team. Um, I thought they maybe had, you know, general quality and they'd take a step forward. But in my view, you know, Nebraska played a couple teams close, but was overall quite bad. Um, and sometimes we look at those like close team, close games against good teams, ignore the rest of the the noise there, and start assuming the team's going to be really, really good when the truth is they can take a step forward and, and merely be okay. What the model's telling me is sort of a not-so-fast thing. Uh, and I'll give a quick presser from the model, being that maybe the fans haven't heard it. It's the first week we've done it this year, um, so I'll try to be 90 seconds on it. Our model takes per-play stats, so yards per carry, yards per attempt, and sort of builds a matrix of how you've done against your opponents and how your opponents have done against everybody else they've played. We do per play stats because we're trying to factor out things like tempo. Um, and we don't really care that you have 500 yards on the ground if you've run the ball 90 times. Um, you know, it's more impressive if you roll the ball 30 times uh, and you have 400 yards. So in that sort of scenario, once we've built this whole matrix, what our model does is it looks at how you're all the different factors that have caused you to score in games. And it says, you know, in these conditions, your team tends to score X amount. And it does it in a nonlinear way, meaning we're not just assigning points per play or points per yard, 
but rather the model is saying when you hit certain thresholds, when certain things happen at a certain frequency, your scoring goes up or it starts to fall down. And the reasons for that is in like the four to six yard per play range, most teams generally are going to be operating and they'll score somewhere around 20 to 30 points. A lot of teams, they have to cross a certain threshold to be successful, meaning like LSU pro style offenses often have to be you know, operating like six yards of play to work. Uh, a spread team can operate at a lower yardage and still be able to move the chains because they're, you know, getting four yards consistently with receiver screens, zone reads, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a certain point where your scoring just goes way, way up. You know, when you hit eight, nine yards per play, you can score 60. All of a sudden, six to eight makes a big difference. In our model in this game, it has Ohio State 46, Nebraska 34. That's a 12-point game. Still has Ohio State the favorite, but not necessarily by a huge percentage. Um, you know, an underlying stat here, uh, we talk about percentage, opponent percentages allowed, right? So one of the intermediary, intermediary stats that our model generates is, you know, whatever your opponent averages, you know, what percentage of that do you allow them to do? So if, they all, if your opponents all average six yards per carry and you allow four, um, then you're allowing 66% of their averages. Ohio State's numbers are awesome. 59% of opponent rushing averages allowed, 80% of opponent passing. Anything below, uh, really those numbers are elite in both categories. It's hard to get too low on passing averages. Part of the reason passing offenses scale better than run offenses. Um, that 59% similar to what Clemson was last year, which was in the 50s. I think it got down to the 40s at one point. I think the interesting thing here is, one, Nebraska is actually in the low 90s, 92% rush, 94% pass. That means they're serviceably good. I mean, they were terrible last year, but they're an okay defense on both sides of the ball. And then the next thing is, you know, Nebraska's offense is really, really good. Um, and they've scored consistently this season 30 to 45 points. So you put all that, that together and you end up with a pretty good team in Nebraska that maybe shouldn't win this game, but should be able to actually make it competitive. And I want to kind of preface the rest of this video with, and I don't think you disagree. Like neither one of us are super high on Nebraska, but Nebraska being a great team or elite team versus Nebraska doing things in a certain way in terms of matchups that might give Ohio State a hard time. And when we say hard time, meaning maybe Ohio State fans don't expect to win this game by 35 points, which you still very well might. Um, Nebraska has this loss to Colorado, but Colorado is a sneaky good team this year under Mel Tucker. I actually tweeted about this today. Um, Mel Tucker's done a phenomenal job there. They're, they're an, a, a one-score loss away from being uh, 4-0, and they've got two ranked wins already. So um, that's not that terrible. As we thought early in the season that that's a terrible loss, it's not that terrible. Um I wonder too if there's something here in that, and this is not going to be shown in the numbers so much as just in terms of our gut or even our interest of where Ohio State is as a defense. Um, the fact that they really haven't played a good quarterback this year, I wonder for all of Nebraska's faults, they've got some good quarterback play. So I wonder if that is something that is interesting here in terms of how Nebraska might give um, might give Ohio State some issue. Also, I wonder in terms of our modeling, the fact that Ohio State has played bad teams, make no mistake, they've played a bunch of bad teams. Cincinnati's bad. I don't care what y'all say. Yes, Cincinnati's going to win a bunch of games this year. They could go 10-2 and two this year and have zero ranked wins against like the top 70 teams in college football. Their schedule is that easy. They're not a good football team. Um, but the fact that they've played a lot of bad teams in terms of metrics and outcomes that a computer model is expecting might actually be hurting them. Uh, do you think that's kind of what's going on here and why it's not predicting a, better, a bigger win? Or do you think Nebraska is just better than we think they are? It's always a little bit of both, I think, when you're looking at these models. And, I mean, if you're new to the channel, a lot of – we say we're a data-driven discussion. What we mean by that a lot is – we're looking at numbers that are in front of us and then we're trying to figure out what they mean. We don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that you should be a slave to the numbers and that just because some advanced metric tells you this is what a team is, that's what they are. 
we think numbers are data points and they're interesting you know things that you can flesh out to figure out if there's some something to be gleaned from some sort of pattern uh some clue as to what the game's going to be one of the things that tends to happen when you play bad teams is models react to it in different ways and it i think a lot of times depends on the style of offense you play the style of defense you play uh, and how all that kind of stuff interacts I think historically with Ohio State and the spread offense they've run, I would say normally playing bad teams has really made them be overranked uh, in a lot of advanced metrics. I personally, frankly, have been a little uh, a, a little critical at times of some of the metrics like SP Plus in terms of how they operate against these elite teams running spread offenses. And the reason for that, and it's nothing that there's wrong with the models, but it's there's sometimes, I think, an error in how people perceive it. SP Plus, for example, which I love and use all the time, it tends to rank teams or does rank teams based off how you would perform against an average opponent. So it gives a rating that sort of a, when you're facing an average football team, which average realize means like 65th in the country, there's 130 teams. This is the predicted scoring margin, you know, maybe 30, 35 points. That scoring margin does not always translate to higher ranked teams. So if you're in Ohio State, or and we've seen this before, and you face an elite uh, defense, all of a sudden that offense that was scoring 50 points a game can score zero. I think the biggest thing from Ryan Day, from both of us, is we feel like he's probably a little more apt to not just totally rely on that scheme. And I think they're probably less likely to roll out a conquer, whereas I think Meyer was a little bit too much of a slave to the zone read ideas that led to some of those problems. You know, the flip side is that you have some teams that beat up on bad opponents, um, you know, maybe defensively. And this is what we've seen from Michigan. When Michigan was playing, uh, you know, really bad or average offenses, their defense was fantastic. And when they played, you know, do you want to throw out the stat, Daniel? Because you love always throwing out the stat and every opportunity. 32.5 points per game versus team versus offenses that ranked in the top 50. So, and that's another example of how advanced stats can be kind of screwed up where you say, you know, Michigan is the number one defense in SP+, but they're the number one defense against an average team. They, they may be actually a pretty poor defense against an elite team. And for playoff contenders, that's what we care about. What we're seeing from Ohio State right now is they're a really, really good team. Top shelf team, genuine playoff contender. Um, Nebraska sort of presents a unique set of challenges. They're a high scoring team. Um, and then Ohio state's offense, which has been very good. You know, it's, I hasn't really been able to sustain high scoring offense throughout all these games. I think they haven't been hurt by the poor competition. I, I think probably it helps them in most ratings, but I will say to round out this whole discussion, which is long winded, but hopefully interesting to stat nerds. Our model is very heavily matchup based. So it, doesn't produce like a rating for Ohio State. Our model is generated based off putting the two teams in and it creates a model for those two teams in this matchup. It couldn't give you a general rating for a team. It's not built that way. It makes it a lot less useful if you're ESPN or someone because you want to rank the teams 1 through 130. Um, but in some ways, I think it probably does make it better in a predictive sense. Um, and in our model, Ohio State is punished a little more for playing bad teams. And the reason for that, for example, if you're playing a team that runs the ball like Florida Atlantic for 2.3 yards per carry, or Miami of Ohio rushes for 1.8 yards per carry, you can play a phenomenal defensive football game, give up 45 yards rushing, of which 48 were on one play, and otherwise you hold them to negative yardage, and you do a bad or average game in our, our model's eyes because the opponent is so bad. Um, basically it really is just, there's no way to distinguish yourself because you haven't played anybody good enough to show how good you are. That is, I think maybe the, the position that Ohio state's in, but I, I thought it was maybe an interesting discussion to sort of flesh out the way advanced metrics work in some ways and versus comparative metrics like ours. You know, and you did touch on something that I want to clarify because everybody's going to jump all over it in the comments and I'm going to save them. Um, when you mentioned how Urban Meyer like, like to rely a lot on the zone read game and they're going to say, well, what about Dwayne Haskins who, you know, threw it all over the yard and never ran the ball. And 
I would say to that, he still did that short passing game, play in space sort of thing. And it wasn't necessarily adjusting to whatever he saw. And a good example of this is the Purdue game where I think Haskins had almost something like almost 500 yards passing, but he also had like 72 attempts. This is memory. And I I don't want you to check it to see uh, how close I was because I'm doing that from memory. But that was the kind of thing where, okay, you're not necessarily doing a zone read option where the quarterback's going to run it you know, 20 times a game like he might have done with JT Barrett, but you you are using zone read concepts and a super short passing game as an extension of your run game instead of more of a different spread style offense that we've seen even this year with Justin Fields, who also can run the ball. Um, so there's a little nuance there, but I, I, I hope that came through. Um, talking about bad teams, sort of throwing the data off a little bit, Let's spend a couple of minutes on the Nebraska Illinois game because I think I think Ohio State fans are going to look at the Nebraska Illinois game and say forty two to thirty eight against one of the worst teams in the country. We're going to just smoke Nebraska. Um, talk about how that might be a little bit misleading, and then we'll get into picks. So first, I'll give you credit. So Purdue seventy three attempts, six point four. Oh, per that's pretty good. Yeah, off by one. Yeah, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you credit on that one, uh, but. You know, I, I will say sort of there's an opposite point you were making, which is Twain Haskins against Michigan lit them up in a way they hadn't been able to do in years. I think in my largely due to the fact that they weren't running JT Barrett in the zone read. Um, and that wasn't really a fault of Barrett in my mind. That's a fault of that style of offense and how it doesn't translate against defense like Michigan, who doesn't translate against good passing and offenses. Anyway, uh, when you look at Nebraska, Illinois, and you look at the score and you say 42 to 38, that's not a good indicator of how that game went from a predictive standpoint. Um, Illinois gave Nebraska a good game. Okay. You got to give Illinois credit for it. We're not saying you don't give them credit for it, but we don't really care about how that game went right now in this discussion uh, in terms of score. What we care about is what were the takeaways from Nebraska in terms of how good they were and how good Illinois were. Nebraska dominated that game statistically. 32 first downs to 14, 671 total yards to 299, 9.6 yards per attempt, 5.4 yards per carry, to 3.3 yards per attempt, and 5.8 yards per carry. Overall, that game was a complete annihilation by Nebraska of Illinois in a game that they were losing. So how does that happen? Well, it's four fumbles, and three of those four fumbles led directly to points. That was 21 points in the game. If those don't happen, then you're looking at something like a 42-17 game, only it's possessions lost by Nebraska, so it's maybe more like 49-17, 56-17. Peters from Illinois was 9 of 22 for 78 yards, okay? And Martinez was 22 of 34, 327 yards, three touchdowns. And Martinez also rushed for over 100 yards. Basically, this game was totally driven by turnovers and turnover luck. We talk a lot, and everybody in advanced stats will tell you, Fumble recoveries are probably the most random statistic in football. Um, it doesn't really matter. Fumbles in general are random, and then fumbles recoveries are even more random. Right. You can. There's a little bit of a trend line that some guys individually are fumblers, but when you look at it, it in a macro sense, meaning you don't know who's going to handle the ball enough in a given game, it's really hard to tell when a fumble is going to occur, and they, they kind of occur in clumps. Some, some games you'll have three, some games you'll have none. But what's worse is as soon as the ball's on the ground, from a statistic perspective, it is a literal coin flip. There has never been a team that was good at recovering fumbles or bad at recovering fumbles. It's just literal luck on how it bounces. Everything went wrong for Nebraska in this game. But, you know, from a predictive stance, they destroyed Illinois per play. And and I'll draw a comparison for you. So Cincinnati versus Ohio State, okay? Ohio State had 8.8 yards per attempt, 5.4 yards per carry. Nebraska had a higher per attempt average and a slightly lower per carry average than Ohio State did in that game. Now, defensively, Cincinnati was 7.2 yards per attempt, 3.1 yards per carry. Illinois was three only 3.3 yards per attempt, 5.8 yards per carry. Um, The point there being, when you compare the two next to each other, and you can probably hear my mouse clicking because I'm trying to pull up um, these stats as quickly as I can on the fly. 
in a lot of ways, Nebraska had a better game against Illinois than Ohio State did in their game against Cincinnati. And they gave up 4.8, Ohio State gave up 4.8 yards per play against Cincinnati. Nebraska gave up 4.9 yards per play against Illinois. <coughs> However, again, Nebraska uh, still ran, had seven yards per play uh, against Illinois. Uh, and Ohio State did not manage seven yards per play against Cincinnati. So you look at 42 nothing, or you look at 42-38, and you feel like you have two totally different ball games. You do in the sense that one of them was in a lot more danger of losing than the other. But from a predictive sense, in terms of how they did in those individual games, really Nebraska was about as good against Illinois as Ohio State was against Cincinnati. It's more a question of whether Nebraska is going to shoot themselves in the foot that much in the future. But in terms of how good they are, how well they can pass, how well they can defend... Um, you know, they, they had an excellent game in that game. And I think a lot of people probably don't have the proper takeaways because they look just at the score. And look, Ohio state fans know this from their game against Nebraska last year. Like Ohio state was a good three touchdowns better than Nebraska last year and had to hang on to win that game. And it's funny because I'm the, the Browns Rams game is going on right now as, as we record this and you talk about Illinois had 3.3 yards per attempt and 78 total yards passing, but managed 38 points. The inverse of that, the Rams until they just scored, um, Jared Goff had 260 yards, eight yards an attempt and they had 10 points. So, that's just both those are two ends of the spectrum but you see 3.3 yards per attempt and 78 yards passing and it's not army and you see 38 points on the board that's absolutely just ridiculous it's a bizarre stat line frankly when i when i looked at it we felt like i felt like we needed to inject this discussion at some point because i mean it's not like they ran the ball that well 5.8 yard per carry is good it's not great uh, three to have three point three yards per attempt and score thirty eight points in a game, I'm sure I've seen it happen before, but I can't think of any examples offhand. That that's a really weird random score, and again, from a predictive sense, I take a lot more from Nebraska outgaining them six seventy one to two ninety nine than I do the forty two to thirty eight. All right, so let's wrap this up. Go ahead and give me your score prediction for this one, and and, and we'll move it along. I I do think this game's going to be close. I think it's going to be probably fairly high scoring. Um, I'm going to go 49 to 35. Uh, wow. it, it, I think Ohio state's going to be able to put it away. I think Nebraska's just going to be irritatingly keeping this close. Um, I didn't think this game would be close at the beginning of the season. And, and I will say too, this is my main curiosity. Can Ohio state, really compensate for a Nebraska offense that's dynamic and has a dynamic skill player at quarterback because last year, like the Maryland game, Ohio state had some issues at linebacker and the way the defense would have busts. Um, the TCU was not really a great game, uh, for Ohio state and it was sort of lauded early, but we flagged, um, and we had flagged it on, I think all the way back to the Oregon state game, there were signs of glitches in the defense and I don't think they've played anyone that's good enough to challenge them. This may be a team that's good enough to expose whether or not the defense is fixed. So, you know, I'm saying 49-35 without knowing that. Uh, I think this game is going to be, act- in truth, really the first real test to say if the defense has fixed itself. Uh, I'm also curious to see how well Fields can keep the offense going on the other side when he hasn't really been asked to consistently move the chains for an entire ball game. Usually we're either you usually we're we're pretty close, and sometimes we'll pick different teams, but feel like the score like like you might say a team's going to win twenty seven twenty four, and I might say the other team's going to win twenty seven twenty four. We're usually pretty close. In this one, we're we're not as close. Um, I, I think I don't want to speak for you and say you're not high on Iowa State. I think you're more you're playing more of a wait and see game than I am at this point. Um, I think Ohio State is one of I think the top six teams in the country um, are a good bit away from everybody else. And they're all kind of interchangeable. Um, I think Ohio state wins this 30, 41, 24. Um, I do think that fields will have a decent day and I don't, I'm not impressed with Nebraska defensively. 
And I, I think this is just a little bit different Ohio State team in, in, in all of the right ways that they needed to be that they weren't last year or in other years where they were left out of the playoffs because they lost to somebody they shouldn't have. I, I think this is a more – just well-rounded, maybe not elite talent in every position like we've seen in other teams, but in terms of just a team, um, I, I like them a little more. Um, tell me, so g- give me a score in this game. Ohio State, let's assume Ohio State wins this game. Give me a score in this game that makes you firmly, solidly feel there in the playoffs, and give me a score in this game that makes you worry that they may not make it. Ohio State could, and, you know, if they were a solid, like, clear-cut playoff team in my mind, this game is probably something like 56 to 20. Uh, Nebraska's defense is not, in my view, particularly good. I mean, I've done a lot to sort of pump them up just to sort of explain why I think this game could be competitive. Um, I I don't think the defense is very good. Uh, and They should be able to score a lot of points, but I think it's just, conversely, Ohio State really needs to limit Nebraska's Offensive production because I I don't Ohio State should score a lot and their offense is designed to score a lot against bad defenses. There's a lot of easy plays in that offense and you've got a mobile quarterback that can strain a bad defense that you know is, is struggling to stay in man coverage. So you got to get safeties over the top, which means you have no help to deal with a quarterback. He can run for a lot of yards. Fields has not been in a position yet where when he doesn't see his options open that. He has to take a sack or find a way to get a guy open. He's been able to consistently just tuck it and run it. Um, that's not going to be available all the time. But Nebraska's not made the test for that. I, I'm more curious to see, you know, can they sustain it? And just can, not make mistakes, get that score up really high. And then defensively, um, have they fixed the glitches to where this, this game is 20 points or less and they're not giving up big plays um, through mental lapses or through bad angles defensively? Um, it, it, You know, the one last thing I'll say on this, and before I turn it back to you, I don't think either one of us is crazy, right? Because I had this as a 14-point game, and you had it as a 17-point game. Our model has it as a 12-point game, and the line is 15 and a half, according to my bookie. So, really, we're all right there with the spread, um, which... We don't rely on the spread in any way in making our models, by the way. It's just an interesting reference point to see if we're crazy. Um, I don't think we are crazy. I mean, that, that is where Vegas thinks this game is. I'm not sure what to make of it if, if people think that line is low or high. Um, but, you know, by and large, we do find our model is usually pretty darn close to the spread, in this case within a field goal. Um, I, I think this is going to be a high-scoring game and, and, you know, have the potential to be a one-possession game to a certain point before Ohio State pulls away. And Ohio State, at least speaking for me, like, when I, I made a tweet before the Ohio State Cincinnati game, and I said, I think it's going to say a lot of bad about Ohio State, or it could potentially indicate some bad about Ohio State if they don't handle Cincinnati. Because I, but in saying that, I was saying I don't think Cincinnati is a good team, and I fully expect Ohio State to handle them, and they did. A lot of people took offense to that because they thought I was dogging Ohio State, and I'm not. I think. Look, Ohio State fans, y'all need to realize, like, when we're talking about playoff teams, we scrutinize you so much harder than we do the 15th best team in the country. If you want to beat Nebraska by six points and be the 15th best team in the country, that's great. If you want to be a playoff team, you need to smoke bad teams. Now, I don't think Nebraska is a bad team like Cincinnati or God knows Miami Ohio is a horrible team. I think there's a couple of things in noting that Ohio State has played bad teams so far. One, it means we don't know what we don't know. And that could be good or bad. Just saying, you know, and we've said this about Clemson for two years, Clemson plays a horrible schedule. Clemson fans aren't even arguing with it anymore. They play a horrible schedule. They're still an elite team. I'd still put them in the playoffs right now if I had to, and maybe that's because they've earned some benefit of the doubt or whatever, but they can't help who is put in front of them. They can help how they handle their business. Historically, Ohio State has stubbed their toe up a couple of times in handling their business. This year, they're not doing that. I don't think they need to beat Nebraska 56 to 20 to be a playoff contender. I think that's a little bit of a high bar, but I do think a solid two, three touchdown win means at least that I feel good at putting them in that playoff conversation. I've seen enough from Nebraska to know they're not a bad team. 
but to know that if this is a 31-28 game without some of these weird apparitions like the Illinois game, I'm going to have some concerns. Um, so far, I don't have concerns. So far, I think Ohio State is a playoff team, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Anything else on this game? No. Nope. Well, that was succinct. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for hanging on this week. Ohio State and Nebraska. We're going to be we'll get into the meat of the Ohio State schedule. They've got a lot of games coming up that we're going to talk about. A little sleepy early season. Again, not their fault. Uh, for those of you who don't know, who are watching this and are not an Ohio State fan, um, they generally schedule really well out of conference. Uh, this year, their big out-of-conference game in Cincinnati, they had to scramble late because TCU backed out. So really not Ohio State's fault. Um, but anyway, thanks so much, y'all, for hanging out this long. Remember, subscribe and like. It helps us a lot. Y'all have a great week, and God bless. <laughs>